Welcome to this webinar about how to reduce transfer pricing compliance costs. This webinar is organized by TPA Global and my colleague Maria Krikoyeva and myself, my name is Marcy van der Valk, will present this webinar. We see that countries have become more and more aggressive in their aim to combat corporate tax avoidance and that full tax transparency has become the new norm. In the post webs world, the global transfer pricing compliance has become way more burdensome due to multiple deadlines and complex documentation requirements. Facing all this, multinationals have to take have to take actions to control their transfer pricing risks in a thorough and efficient way, and the related cost should not follow this substantially increased burden. With so much external and internal pressure, we see in practice that often questions come up like, what tools should be developed and implemented internally to control and reduce the increased compliance cost? How to organize a successful TP function? And how to deal timely and efficiently with TP risks, TP compliance, and TP communication to stakeholders? This is what we will talk about. Prior to BEPS, the transfer pricing world was way more straightforward. The perspective was mainly local, with local TP documentation and forms. For the preparation of local TP documentation, a local tested party analysis was performed based on a one-sided approach to document the local picture only. Not much more additional information was needed, just only limited local financial data. A local corporate tax return was filed containing information regarding only the local entity uh, disclosed that needed to be disclosed for local corporate tax filing obligations and the TP compliance was completed. Um, however, with respect to the recent tax trends, we see that until the year 2015, tax and transfer pricing act as silos, as international tax versus transfer pricing with different separate workflows. During the years 2015 and 2016, BEPS integrates international tax and transfer pricing with the economic reality as the driver and to be prevailing. In 2017, value chain analysis is used by tax authorities and multinational enterprises to comply with the increasing demand for full transparency on tax-sensitive data. As you can see, different layers of documentation and filings are required now, disclosing all kinds of sensitive data, causing an increase of burden on the cost side as well as on the resources side. There is the very effective country-by-country -country report, containing key elements of the financial statements by jurisdiction, providing local tax authorities visibility to revenue, income, tax paid and accrued, employment, capital, retained earnings, tangible assets and activities in each jurisdiction where the multinational has a presence. Then we have the master file containing a section for value chain analysis and the group's financial statements. Another layer of transfer pricing documentation is formed by the local TP documentation and forms reflecting the significant people functions based on the two-sided approach. This goes in many countries, hand in hand with filing of the corporate tax return, also reporting information on the local entity, including its intercompany transactions with other entities within the group. These four layers of documentation end up on one and the same desk of the tax inspector in the end and provide actually a, a blueprint and a complete value chain picture of the multinational company. As such, BEPS has a much wider coverage and impact into your organization overlapping departments and so increasing your in-house challenges to manage and the related cost aspects. It is also of utmost importance that these uh, different layers of documentations are aligned and consistent and tell the same story. So coordination of all filings and documentation exercises are very important. However, um, that this, this has its consequence for the workload and cost of fulfilling all these compliance obligations. Um, on the next slide, 
regarding the increased work burden in, this, in, in today, you can see a visualization of the increased work burden based on one of our clients. This multinational group is present in 19 countries with several group entities per country, 65 legal entities in total. And since local files in principle need to be prepared per group entity, and then together with the corporate tax returns and the local TP forms, this means a huge TP compliance burden with constantly filing due dates coming up for this group, as you can see in the chart. And, and as a consequence, CFOs start treating tax and transfer pricing departments as cost centers. And they would like to see less personnel doing more of their more routine considered compliance tasks. The room for tax planning bringing huge financial benefits to the company has decreased significantly as a result of the BEPS project. It's all about meeting the new and increased TP compliance standards. This brings us back to the questions we were discussing in the beginning about how to decrease the TP compliance costs in relation to the setup of the TP function. And with setup, we mean the organization of internal and external processes, the allocation of roles and responsibilities within the team, and the development of manuals. What are the basics on how to organize an eff efficient TP function? The steps and resources required for stringing compliance costs and automation of TP compliance. If carefully implemented, this will contribute to managing your in-house challenges and so contribute to the reduction of TP compliance costs as a result. I will hand over to, Ma to Maria now, who will talk about, about uh, how to become in control under these new transfer price and compliance standards and manage or preferably, preferably limit the TP compliance cost and work burden at the same time. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you might have uh, seen from uh, TPA online and offline events, uh, we are promoting the concept of being in control, where the CFO has to travel a certain journey consisting of six steps, uh, starting from staying out of trouble, meaning that you're just firefighting any upcoming audits or any requests from tax authorities or other stakeholders to rather being fully in control where you know where your data is located, how it's linked to each other, and how to communicate such data uh, to efficient, uh, efficiently to different stakeholders. Uh, today we will not go through this journey again, and if you would like to uh, know more about it, you can uh, visit our website and uh, watch a nice YouTube um, movies about it. Uh, but I will focus on the steps that are reducing compliance costs, or at least helping you to uh, reduce the time span. And these are steps uh, one, two, and five. So, uh, with step one, uh, we mean synchronization of financial and tax data. And what is uh, meaning in practice is that uh, you need to either use uh, one source for your data. Uh, so you don't then uh, require reconciliation, or at least uh, the data should be synchronized in a way that when you are doing multiple disclosures, so for example, you disclose the same data in C by C and the same data in tax return, uh, that uh, you, you are sure that this data tells the same story. Uh, that would definitely help you to avoid uh, the cost and time spent on the additional explanations and additional reconciliations, uh, as well as it helps you to uh, provide a clear picture to tax authorities and other stakeholders, uh, which then helps to avoid adjustments uh, or amendments to your initial file. Uh, step two suggests a global approach to your documentation. And uh, actually, this step is linked to the previous one. So once you have a, a good grip on your data, you can then uh, produce uh, all your documentation globally. And documentation can mean any type of reports, returns, filings, forms, uh, and etc. that you do for your compliance purposes. But when you do it centrally, or at least that uh, you control centrally how this is, is performed, 
uh, you then uh, control uh, the efficiency uh, and it also helps you to eliminate a silo approach, uh, which ensures also timely uh, notifications and thus helps to reduce the uh, cost uh, spent on fines. Uh, as a consequence uh, of your efficient and timely filings of the compliance part, uh, you then uh, spend less time and money on your tax audits and disputes as well and even less uh, on your court litigation because you just don't end up there if you done your homework very good. Uh, and uh, another step is uh, then to manage your in-house challenges and here I uh, give the word back to Maji who will explain you the uh, concept of organizing your internal team. Thank you, Maria. Um, as you can see, in today's post webs world, your in-house challenges are multiple, and managing coordination of them have become highly important to be in control of your TP compliance and cost burden. It is not only about pure compliance cost, but cost in a broad meaning, by the way, so including cost as time and efforts, that are needed to fulfill compliance obligations. For example, if staff and succession planning is well and timely organized with good processes and procedures, it would cost less time and effort to get the new staff member up to speed without too many hiccups and gaps in fulfilling compliance tasks, which could otherwise also potentially result in penalties and interest money-wise or even additional tax assessments. In this way, cost can be limited on this point and is also related to education and knowledge management, for example, to that element that is included in the pie as well, as you can see. If the education and knowledge management is well organized, this helps as well to have a good team taking care of accurately and timely fulfilling the TP compliance and control the related costs. The same goes for the other pies that you see here. They all need to be taken care carefully of to keep your TP compliance costs under control and limit them where possible. Good control of these challenges in accumulation will definitely help to reduce your TP compliance costs while meeting your increased TP compliance burden. The following solution can well assist a multinational group in organizing the tax and TP function in a cost-efficient way. This is the setting up of a so-called RACI matrix for all relevant tax and transfer pricing workflows within the group to clearly allocate roles and respo responsibilities of all stakeholders with respect to each function. In a RACI matrix, the R stands for responsible and means the responsible person who is assigned to perform part or all of the work. The A stands for accountable and means the accountable person who has the authority to sign off on the work before it is effective. And by the way, this can only be one person. The C for consultant means the person who provides information or expertise necessary to complete the project. And the I of informed means the person who needs to be notified of results, but not necessarily to be consulted. This concept can be applied to any workflow to become in control of that workflow so that the workflow is actually performed and also in the proper way, checked and communicated appropriately. This concept can thus be very helpful to be in control of the organizational and operational aspects of tax and transfer pricing workflows. The design and implementation of such a tax and transfer pricing framework can substantiate your tax and transfer pricing storyline on your tax and transfer pricing structures and can also potentially help you in your communication towards tax authorities. On the next slide, you see the RACI concept applied in a practical case where the nine TP workflows that are applicable within most multinationals have been listed. These are the nine building blocks of a successful TP function. They have all been analyzed for this company and have been allocated the letters R, A, C, or I as applicable. And this gives a good insight in where you stand with your TP organization, if it is already fairly robust, 
or where further organization is needed with also the related cost aspect. We recommend that you try to fill in such a matrix for your own organization or department and evaluate the outcome. Um, Maria will now continue with the related change management as aspect uh, to, make it, uh, to make it really practical. As discussed, once you have a good grip on data, uh, once you know where your information is coming from and you have a global approach on how this information should be presented, as well as once you have your uh, workflows organized, so once you know who is doing what and who is responsible, so it is clear and uh, it is uh, really now set up uh, your organization in a, an efficient way, this is where you can start doing a change management and uh, optimizing even further by first moving uh, through standard uh, to standardization and harmonization. Uh, what it would mean, uh, particularly, is uh, standardizing the, the, how your reports are presented. Uh, doesn't matter in which country, because now lots of countries start following the same approach. Uh, also, standardizing your processes that you follow by filing, let's say, a tax return. So in each and every country, uh, your finance person is knowing the exact steps how to do things. Uh, it also applies uh, in a way that uh, you uh, communicate to your stakeholders, being, for example, the board, so they get the same standard report from you and they know where to look and which numbers uh, to assess, uh, which helps really, really to uh, <clears throat> decrease the time spent on uh, compliance. Uh, and when you go through this process and uh, you're standardized and harmonized, then you can even think of the further uh, optimization being outsourcing or using of tools. Uh, you can, of course, uh, use these things at the same time. But the main point here is that, of course, these things, both outsourcing and use of the software tools, require certain investment at the, uh, at the beginning. And here you will ask a question, OK, Actually, spending money, how does it help to reduce the cost? Because it actually increases your cost. And uh, to decide on spending such money, we definitely recommend to create a business case, uh, which also helps you, uh, if, if you are head of tax, for example, to present such case to CFO to get approval on the budget. Uh, to start creating this business case, uh, we suggest to assess the time and money spent on the compliance uh, for example, TP documentation. Uh, and we suggest to assess the expenses for your previous three years, and then, for example, if you're considering a software tool, to assess the expenses by uh, using this tool in the upcoming three years, uh, including the license and the time money spent on the implementation. You can then compare these two averages for three years and see if you indeed have the saving. And of course, the first year uh, for the software tool will be higher than the subsequent years, but then the average would show you the more accurate result. And then by having this number, you would say uh, to your CFO that, okay, though now we should spend, let's say, 100,000 euro, but uh, on three year average, we would save 60,000 euro. I guess this is the best argument that you can present. And it's, a, I think, uh, the only way that you can see how uh, the compliance cost is really reduced. Uh, the same thing applies to outsourcing, because you can think of some workflows uh, cannot be performed internally or just take too much time internally, while the time, the precious time and the knowledge that the person has should be allocated to resolving really difficult issues. So for example, uh, if we talk about VAT, uh, if you have only one person in the team who is very knowledgeable, then the time of this person should be spent on really resolving uh, difficult issues such as audits, while the return filing can be outsourced because uh, this thing is just cheaper to be done outside. Uh, and of course, to define which workflow uh, to uh, use for this business case, you need to uh, look at your organization and define uh, and assess your workflows. 
to do this, you just need to uh, think that uh, which workflows are very simple and repetitive and think of other workflows uh, which are more difficult and others that are really complex and happen maybe once a year. Then by uh, assessing your workflows in this manner, you just draw a certain line under which you say, okay, these workflows are so simple, so routine that even the software can do it or even uh, a shared service center uh, can do it or uh, just some consultant, let's say, sitting in the Philippines can do it. Something along those lines. And this really would depend on your organization, but we are uh, having a strong point that many organizations nowadays, especially in the light of standardization of documentation and different returns, have these certain workflows that can be outsourced or automated or both. Uh, another point to consider when creating your business case is the way your organization is built. Uh, and of course, it would really depend from company to company, but we see three major types of organizations. One, where we, uh, which we call central. Uh, this is where you, where you have a central core team uh, at your headquarters, which doing everything, which is setting the policy, which is preparing documentation, all reports and returns, and uh, local people are only providing support. So, for example, providing local finance or just suggesting some certain local changes as required. The second option is where the central team is smaller one. Uh, and in a way, it's only uh, setting the policy and then uh, doing quality control based on this policy while all the reports, returns and fines are done locally. Uh, and really uh, by operational or finance people on the ground. Uh, the third option uh, is where the uh, actual uh, work is performed by a shared service center uh, in a certain location, while central team is again doing QC, uh, and local team is providing certain support uh, through providing financials or local specialties. Uh, this uh, three types of organizations would then correspond to the process presented above, where uh, the sourcing of data can come from local or central financials or central uh, or local uh, ERP. Then uh, it would, of course, depend where the data is processed. So is it the central team preparing it or is it rather a local team preparing it and processing the data? And then who is preparing the delivery, uh, being all the filings and reports. And again, that depending on the model, can be central or local or even in the shared service center. Uh, depending on the model you have, uh, you can think of different options of outsourcing or using software. Because, of, uh, of course, uh, not uh, all software packages would fit all organizations. Uh, and in my experience, uh, most of them are built uh, mainly for um, central teams, so where central team really uh, has lots of controls on the filing, while local people are on the support side. Uh, also, uh, as Margie presented to you, uh, the RACI concept helps to, be, to build this business case where uh, you need to define how to allocate workflows when it comes to use of technology. And uh, in this slide, we presented an example of how the use of technology, uh, in particular for TV documentation production, uh, helps uh, can be allocated through the use of RACI. So, uh, as you might remember from the previous slide, uh, the person uh, who is responsible uh, should prepare the documentation. And in this case, you see it as a super user, so somebody who can edit the reports, edit transactions, and et cetera. And the person who is accountable, and here it's a lead TP, is an administrator. So somebody who can really uh, check the main things, look at the audit trail, and uh, if needed, uh, undo the changes. Uh, also somebody who is responsible for C by C, and migrating the data to next year. While uh, people who are consulted, so for example, finance local team uh, and uh, local tax team, they have only 
uh, review rights and they can view report and only download it. Uh, this example, of course, can be applied to any kind of software package that you use, but again, helps to reduce the time spent uh, on defining uh, who actually is performing the work, while, you know, from the very beginning that this person is responsible for certain thing and another person is uh, reviewed. And I think with this, uh, we want to yeah, make yourself think, where are you on your tax journey and where are you uh, on your compliance journey in a way that are you only started thinking that you need to reduce your cost or, uh, or you already have a certain definition of how your team is organized? Uh, are you considering to use a software or are you considering to outsource certain things? Uh, the only recommendation we really give is you should make it practical. Uh, you should really think uh, of the savings that certain things can provide to you. And of course, you should be ready to come through the pain of standardization and harmonization, which is, uh, as we now think, is inevitable in the light of BAPS, which is now even implemented in the OECD guidelines and also uh, in the light of developments that other countries are implementing. Uh, this is something that has to be done. And of course, uh, you have us as your advisors to support you on this journey. Uh, but lots of things have to be done inside the organization. And uh, it comes with certain cost and time. But uh, we definitely believe that this time and, uh, and uh, cost invested would bring you much more savings in the upcoming year. Yeah, and therefore, a more long-term view in this regard is, is appropriate, should be taken. We got a question uh, if we recommend to implement any kind of software. Uh, on this point, uh, we had a separate event last year, but we definitely will organize a webinar on this one. But what we recommend uh, when thinking of the uh, implementing uh, any kind of software is first, uh, to again look into your organization. So is your organization ready for the software? Second, look into what you have already in-house. So let's say if it's something related to finance, then we strongly suggest to talk to your IT and your finance and look into solutions that you might have in-house. Uh, and then three, if you really feel that you are ready for the software, then uh, create a tax technology plan by defining, as I explained previously, which workflows uh, you want to automate and uh, defining the criteria for your software and then only running vendor selection and looking in what the market ha can offer you. Yeah, so but definitely tech technology uh, will be needed, but you need to prepare it. Yeah, you, you, need to, you really need to be ready for tax technology because the cases we've seen uh, that uh, the companies were unhappy with the technology because, uh, yeah, they they were just sold it and they didn't really think how it fits their organization. So to avoid such cases, uh, we strongly recommend to first look how it fits and if it really is something that you you need and that really that's something that would help you to save the cost. Yeah, and first fix what is needed to make it successful. You first need to fix to make your organization ready, but you explained it already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you, and have a good day.